Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is Sports Fan News. I'm Joe Borg, and this is going to be a video on the lively, bonkers Stanley Cup playoffs this far as we check in on the playoffs and analyze what has happened this far heading into the second round. Now, I already did do some series caps on a couple of the series in this, like the St. Louis and the Nashville and Colorado series. So if you want to go check those out, go check those out because we're not going to touch on those individual series in this video <clears throat> being I already did those in a separate video. But when it comes to the rest, the Stars absolutely pushed the Calgary Flames to the brink. And the Flames were able to win that game one nothing in Game 1. A great defensive stalwart battle that um, Jay Godinger was grading Cage again. Then in Game 2, Jay Godinger gets a shutout. As they win 2 to nothing, and we'll get back to Ottinger, obviously, as everyone knows. Then the Stars compound that 2 nothing shutout by riding the momentum from their goaltender into a 4-2 to two win where they're actually able to get 4 goals on the tally sheet in Game 3. But then the Stars' offense goes back to Stars' things of not being able to figure out enough goal scoring from the overall club and lose 4-1 to one in Game 4 to even up the series. And then Game 5... The Flames then compounded that, just like the Stars did from the 2-0 shutout. They rode the momentum from their 4-1 win into a 3-1 win the next game, which then um, the Stars rebounded. And that's why this series was so good, because it was just a game of the Stars rode the momentum from their 2-0 game 2 win into game 3, and then the game 4 win 4-1 four uh, by the Flames. They rode into game 5 to win 3-1, but then the Stars found a rebound found an answer, and were able to have a 4-2 to two win over the Flames in Game 6. Obviously, a big part of that game, again, was Jake Ottinger having a good game. And then we move on to Game 7, where Jake Ottinger was the only reason, and I mean the only reason, that game was in overtime. The Flames had 67 shots, and I'm not even one of those shots or the biggest key go guys. I'm one of the care more about the chances than the shot total. But damn, did the Flames have a lot of really good chances in that game. And you have to give up. Uh, Daryl Sutter said it himself. Jake Ottinger was the best player of that series. Losing effort or not, it wasn't because of him. The offense only in a couple games was able to get enough going in front of him. That's why they lost. It wasn't at all because of Jake Ottinger. Great series, great job by the Flames, though, to persevere and to get that goal by Goudreau to wipe out all the doubters. I wasn't one of them, but doubters for what he could do in the postseason. So great job all around in that series. Fantastic overall series. Kings and Oilers. Oh, also, the Flames won. Money and I both got right. We got the games wrong, I think, but the games are kind of just a crapshoot. But we both did pick the Flames, but they definitely took it longer than expected. That's why... You got to give all the kudos and the hats off and claps up to Rick Bonus and the Stars. He doesn't play the sexiest system. I understand some fans is boring, but it worked because it got them to seven with the Flames. Nobody expected that. And then now, when it comes to the Kings and Oilers, talk about a weird series because LA started this one off with a very nice four to three win. Obviously, there's some goals in that game that Mike Smith would want back, but the Kings were able to win nonetheless. And then they just have nothing for two games, and the Oilers are killer, and are able to rail off six goals and shut them out six to nothing in a playoff game after the Kings just won four to three. Explain to me how that happened. Uh, after a game one, you would think the Kings would have some momentum. Absolutely not. The Oilers did carry that momentum into game three as they smoke showed the Kings again, and the Kings were only able to get two goals and won eight to two. But then somehow, <clears throat> back... In Game 4, after bad back-to-back -back games, the Kings were able to figure it out at whatever the arena is called now, as they were able to win 4 to nothing. It was, of course, Staples. Now it's whatever the heck the name of that uh, uh, arena is. But, I mean, th this game, they were able to answer back. Trevor Moore scored. Troy Stetcher, I think you have to give a claps up to and a 
shout out to for this series. A guy that's been a journeyman and hasn't been able to really find his way. He's been on three different teams but never been able to find his way in the NHL yet. Well, he had a very good playoffs once he comes came subbed in and it started all in this game as he was able to get that nice goal. Grunstrom then was able to tally two, one being the empty netter, and also played a good playoffs for the Kings in a losing effort. So the Kings showed bounce back. So just like the Flames and Stars series, this was one that both teams just showed bounce back once the other seemed like it was going to have the answers going in one direction. Like there were two great games from the Flames. Like I said, there were two great games from the Oilers, but then the Kings shut them out for nothing. And then the Kings are able to have that battle OT win after having the 4 nothing win, 5-4 in OT. And at that point, you're thinking, okay, the momentum's probably riding towards the Kings' side. But then, no, the Oilers come in, and in Game 6, you have to give. McDavid started off the scoring, but I think you have to give for how well he played in this game. He scored the tip-in second goal, was active all around. Evander Kane, a star of this game, because he also ended up scoring the seal it, which was assisted by McDavid the seal at empty netter. And then that, of course, kept the Oilers going so they could even have their Game 7, which was, of course, on the 14th, and the Oilers were able to shut out the Kings 2 to nothing, as they were able to push the offense enough and play some of the better defensive hockey you've seen from the Oilers, I think, in a long time, as CC speaking of defense, was able to score... And then Connor McDavid was able to get the empty netter, and the Kings were just not able to get enough high ante shots on in that game. And they fall to Mike Smith and the Oilers, which is then going to give us the Battle of Alberta that I will be previewing soon with E. Money Sullivan, as we're going to be going into that, just like we previewed the first round series. But then, quickly, I guess, uh, I said I'm not going to go into them, but uh, in, in the Avalanche and... Predator series, of course, that was just, Connor Ingram should have stole game two, the Avalanche couldn't have scored enough, they got deservingly swept because they should have been able to win a game two, then they couldn't take advantage of the backup goaltender, even though Francois was a very good backup goalie, but you would think you would be able to maybe get one or two on a guy that's coming in cold and hasn't played for a while, they couldn't do so, so what happened there, they deserved to get swept. In six, the Wild, bad first game, great second game, and third game, and then after that, that was all she wrote. The Wild just couldn't figure it out after those second and third games. Their offense went dormant, and that's what cost them in that series. Again, I already did that series recap, so you can go check those out for more in-depth ones. When it comes to the Rangers and Penguins, this to me was, even though it's two rivals of my own team, but I'm an overall hockey fan, cover overall hockey on this channel, this was one of the most interesting series to watch. Pittsburgh came in, had a brilliant OT win, well, brilliant OT win, brilliant <laughs> triple OT win, as finally they were able to end it around the boards, good play by Capitan on the boards, be able to get it up, and then uh, it was able to be a nice goal there from Afghani Malkin on the tip in as Marino fired it after Capitan passed it up boards to him, uh, to the point. And then the Penguins ride that momentum into losing so it's like it's the same thing as the kings it's like how did you have that high of having a nice win in the first game and then somehow get flattened in the second game but you have to also give credit to the rangers for them bouncing back getting that 5-2 win but then the penguins bounce back at a 7-4 win in the goal onslaught one of the goal onslaught games of this playoffs and then again in a goal onslaught game the Penguins score back-to-back -back games of seven goals. So at that point, you're going, okay, the Rangers don't seem to have them figured out at all. They won the they won the uh, first game with four goals, then just didn't find anything in the second game as the Rangers deed up good. Sesterkin had a good game, and they played very good offensively to win 5-2. But then back-to-back -back seven goal games of a 7-4 winning game three and a 7-2 winning game four. It looks like they didn't have them figured out. But long and behold, Gerard Gallant rallies his troops together, and they win three straight, 5-3 back-to-back days, and 4-3 to three in the finale as Shesterkin steps up big time in especially Game 5 and Game 7, and was still solid in Game 6. So Igor was able to, after having a bad start to the series of moments he would want back, was able to really shine bright in the end, the guy that's likely going to be our Vezina Trophy winner this year and should be. 
And then Bruins. The Bruins are another team, as we're wrapping up this video, I'm going to try to make it about 12 to 13 minutes. Uh, the Bruins are another team that are absolutely, you have to give them credit, they pushed the Carolina Hurricanes to the brink, where I think, um, I know E-Money did take the Bs, I did take the Canes, so this was a series that I ended up uh, picking in the right direction, but the Hurricanes started off really good, so you thought it was definitely going in their direction. The first two games, they would be a five goals each, a five to one and a five to two um, win there, and it, it, it was nice to see them be able to do that. Ronta played good in cage in game one, and uh, in game two, <clears throat> you were able to have Ronta, Ronta and Kochekov were in that game, but uh, both of them were able to play fine as well in that 5-2 to two win. So that was a good game overall. And then the Bruins, though, found the answering switch, just like most of these series. That's why these players have been so good, because you think it's going in one direction where that's how the NHL players always is. They're so unpredictable, and that's why, to me, I don't care what anyone says, the Stanley Cup players is the best. But it, 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 there's been so many series when it comes to the Flame series, uh, when it comes to the... When it comes to the Rangers series, when it comes to the Kings and Oilers series, that it looks like one team is starting to find it, and then the other team finds an answer. And that's what makes this stuff so fun. But the Rangers um, the Rangers then did find the answers, of course, as they won three straight, and Garor Gallant's team was able to move on in that series. But then the Hurricanes... Um, as I said, got off to a great start. The Bruins, though, then find the answers for Game 3 and Game 4 um, there in Boston. Well, the Bruins played very good when they were in Boston because they won all three of those games. The problem is they just couldn't find anything in Carolina and be able to get it done. They got torched each game in Carolina but played very good in TD Garden. So you got to give them credit for defending their home ice very well as well because in Game 5 they got torched. And then in Game 6, they did the opposite and did a very good job at torching the Hurricanes. But then in Game 7, back in Carolina, the Hurricanes were able to win 3-2 to two as Antti Ranta continued his successful playoff run in net. And Jeremy Swayman played fine as well. It's just two goals ain't going to cut it in a game that you're trying to clinch in the postseason. And Max Domi was an absolute killer MVP in that final series clinching game as well. And then... To wrap it up with the two series that are going to lead to the Battle of Florida, I thought Toronto in the Maple Leaf series was actually pretty good. Obviously, as Mitch Marner and others said, they're tired of feeling that feeling, so they want to get out of that first round. But they started with a great 5-0 win, but then they let the Lightning win 5-3 in the next one, so they didn't have the best continuum in this series, as a bunch of other teams didn't either after a good first game. And then the Leafs did bounce back with a great third game. Lightning railed on them in the fourth game, 7-3. to The Leafs bounced back with a 4-3 win. And then the Lightning won 4-3 to to the Lightning, then winning 2-1, to fending off elimination twice to be able to beat the Leafs in that series. So it did look like the Lightning might have been showing some signs of not being as quick as the last couple seasons, but could you blame them? They played two Stanley Cups and won them in 24 or whatever the hell months it was. So, they've been bonkers, and they were still bonkers enough. Vasilevsky was good, and Point, and Stammer, and all their key players were able to get them, well, obviously you hope Point's fine, but were able to get them over the hump in this series to now move on to the Battle of Florida. And from Toronto's perspective, they also got gypped on that one goal, but I thought they played a good overall series. I would say they play like a B-plus level series. It's just they, their fans don't want to hear that. They want to be in the second round. But when it comes to the Panthers and Capitals, my oh my did this series have me worried because I really wanted to see the Panthers advance. Uh, somebody that wants to see Giroud do successful, and I even throw Hager in there. Robert Hag was a nice uh, guy while here, a fun guy to get to watch. Uh, not a very... Sexy guy to watch, but a guy that just gets it done, and you need to have a couple of those guys on your team. So I throw him in there too. But they went down uh, four to two in the first game, but then bounced back five to one win. So, but then a six to one win from the Capitals in their home born to then bounce back with a three to two win from the Panthers, and then after that, it seemed like the Capitals after the game one and game three win after that game three win where they won six to one. That, that was basically the telltale of where the series was going. If they were able to bounce back and ride the continued momentum, 
I think they would have had a chance in the series, but then they lost a 3-2 to two game in OT, and I think that gave the Panthers, literally that was the turning point of the series, gave them all the momentum to be able to win that game five and win that game six, where I thought Bob played a solid overall series other than game one and three where he was off. I thought, especially three, I thought overall he was very good in two, he was very good in four, and he was solid in the closing game as well. So that's all you need, especially when you have the offense of the Florida Panthers and the defensive catch around him. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the Battle of Florida. But I thought the Panthers played great in that series. I thought the Capitals also probably got like a B-minus or something great for that series, C-plus, because of how good they played in two of those games to, I think, even push the Panthers more than most anticipated from a Capitals team this season. But everybody have a great, safe, and pleasant day. This has been the Stanley Cup Playoffs. Have been bonkers this far. Analysis and check-in by Sports Fanatic News as we're now heading into the next round. There's only eight left now, folks. It's going to get even more interesting. Peace out, everybody, and stay safe.